All right. Good morning, HCAR members. I'm Sarah Anderson, your 2022 HCAR president. And I'm so honored this morning to introduce our special guest, Dr. Lawrence Yoon. Dr. Yoon is chief economist and oversees, uh, oversees the research group at the National Association of Realtors. He supervises and is responsible for a wide range of research activity for the association, including NAR's existing home sales statistics, the affordability index, and the home buyers and sellers profile report. He regularly provides commentary on real estate market trends for NAR's 1.4 million Realtors. So in the interest of time, I'm gonna hand it over to Dr. Yoon and please note that we will have a few minutes after Dr. Yoon's presentation for us this morning for some Q&A. So please feel free to put any questions that you have into the chat. And without further ado, Dr. Yoon, I'll let you take it away. Uh, great, uh, thank you, uh, President Sarah Anderson. Um, the Howard County, uh, you know, situated right between DC and Baltimore, uh, especially uh, in a uh, work from home flexibility, uh, that is a great location to be in. Um, and consequently, last year, when you look at the Howard County statistics, the home sales up uh, roughly 10%, you know, prices rising strongly. Uh, so it's been a quite a good year. Now, I guess uh, one concern that the realtors have uh, is so much competition uh, because we have seen uh, many people wanting to be a realtor. Uh, they have heard the real estate market is strong, so maybe they give it a shot at it. So there is more competition out there, uh, but the backdrop on the real estate market has been exceptionally strong. But now with the mortgage rate rising, uh, what's gonna happen? Uh, all this, I am going to share my PowerPoint slide, uh, which will make the following of the market trend a little easier. So let me do that right now. Okay, so I believe that you can see it on the screen and I will proceed as if uh, there is no technical issues and everything is good. All right, so let's first look at the mortgage rate uh, condition. I put two lines. The blue line is the 30 year fixed rate mortgage according to Freddie Mac. So the mortgage rate trend on the blue line has been generally falling. Uh, for someone who's been in the business for a long time, 1990, mortgage rate of 10%. Uh, back in the year 2000, mortgage rate at 8%. Uh, and when the mortgage rate went down to 6% in the sort of subprime lending days, those risky mortgages, uh, people thought those were exceptionally low mortgage rates, uh, but then it went down even further, all the way down to a record low mortgage rates of 3% throughout last year. Some months actually below 3%. If you are able to get your client into a home at say 2.8%, these are just remarkable mortgage rates that they will look back they will share with their grandkid about, oh, did you know that I purchased my home at 2.8%? So incredibly low. We are past that point. So people who did not get that 3% or below mortgage rates, well, you missed out on the absolute bottom and now the mortgage rate is rising and you can see it on the blue line. Uh, right now, a fairly sharp upturn, average close to 4.5%. So last year, 3% today, 4.5%. What's gonna happen and why is it happening? Let's look at the red line. Red line is the interest rate that the Federal Reserve directly controls. It's not for you and me, it's for the banking system. Uh, and the red line is sometimes moves up, sometimes moves down as you can see, but note how it impacts the blue line, because blue line is what is concerning to you and your clients. So generally speaking, when the Federal Reserve raises interest rate, the red line goes up, the blue line also goes up, but never in one to one proportion, as you can see. And there are time periods, for example, 2004, from 2004 to 2006, over a two year time span, multiple rounds of rate increase, but what happened to the mortgage rates? Barely budge. So the way to interpret the latest mortgage rate increase is the following. The Federal Reserve is getting very nervous about their job. 
their job is to contain inflation. That is one of their two mandates. Other one is to get the job creation going. But their other uh, key mandate is to contain inflation. And inflation, as you know, is getting out of control. Gas station, expensive. Grocery bills, expensive. And therefore, they are trying to contain inflation by raising interest rates. The red line already increased one time, just one time. You see the little edge at the very, very, very bottom. But then why is the blue line rising so sharply? Because the blue line or the mortgage rate is anticipating multiple rounds of rate increases. In fact, the Federal Reserve has hinted that probably around six, seven, or eight times they will raise interest rate over the next 12 months. So in a sense, blue line is anticipating the future action of the Federal Reserve. And therefore, most of the rate increase may have already occurred. 4.5% now. Is 5% possible on the mortgage rate? Yes, it is possible. But uh, it may barely touch that level because most of the rate increase, I believe, has already occurred in anticipation of many rounds of rate increase on the red line, what the Fed directly controls. So just because, say, next month, Federal Reserve will again raise interest rate does not mean the blue line will rise again. Uh, it could remain stable. The only big change is if the Fed somehow says, we have to raise interest rate even more aggressively than what we thought, maybe 10 times or 12 times, then the blue line will be rising uh, as the change in communication occur. So rising mortgage rate, as we know, is hurtful for your home buyers. Certainly, we can see it on the graph on the table on this chart. This is, a hypo, uh, this is from mortgage calculator. All of us has a calculator. You punch in the numbers and you get it. Uh, but let's do it all together uh, here at the same time. On an $800,000 mortgage, uh, which is not unusual for Howard County homes. So last year at 3%, the monthly payment would have been $3,300 monthly payment, excluding property tax, excluding maintenance, you know, excluding insurance. So we know those are the additional costs. But just on the mortgage payment, it would have been $3,300. At 4%, you see the number rise to $3,800. Today, the mortgage rate is above 4%, 4.5%. So it has yet to reach 5%. 5% is possible, but maybe most of the rate increase have already occurred. So maybe you know, 5% is stretching it, uh, but let's say 5% happens. That means that monthly payment would be $4,200. So just compare, one year ago, it was 3,300 and now it is 4,200. How many first time buyers would get squeezed out? I emphasize first time buyers because the repeat transaction, people who are selling to buy, say trade up or trade down, at least they have large capital gains, which they can use as a down payment. Uh, and you know, they don't like the higher mortgage rates, but they, at least they have some finances to work with. First time buyers, they're trying to save up the money, save up the money, and suddenly to say, you have to pay essentially $1,000 more each month not one time each month. I mean, this is a huge burden for the first time buyers. Then hypothetical, let's say interest rate goes up to 6%. Wow, you know, you got it at that level. 10% is not possible, but I still wanna to illustrate to show what could happen. People who have been in the business during the 1980s will say mortgage rate at that time was 18% on a couple of years. So mortgage rate, you know, sometimes could possibly go up that high, but it looks like the Federal Reserve is definitely interested in trying to contain inflation because once you contain inflation, then Fed does not have to raise interest rate further. But if inflation continues to get out of hand, Fed has to be more aggressive. Uh, I will uh, ask everyone uh, regarding the questions, uh, that it will be at the end. So uh, once I finish, but uh, please hold on to your question. Now let's look at one of the contributor to the inflation. 
which is the oil price and gasoline prices. It is very high, as you know. Uh, I mean, uh, recently when I uh, bought a food tank, reaching close to $100. I mean, these are just incredibly high uh, amount. Uh, before, you know, one may not have considered all that much. You said, well, I could expense that out. Uh, but the realtors especially gets hurt more when the gasoline prices rise because realtors drive more than the general population. I thought it would be illustrative to look at the long-term history of the oil prices. Let's go back to 1970 at the beginning of the chart. It was $3 per barrel. So you say everything was cheaper a long time ago. You know, bottle of Coca-Cola was cheaper, airline ticket, you know, you say everything was cheaper. It was $3 per barrel. But then there was a sharp increase and the sharp increase did not just happen gradually. It occurred suddenly when an OPEC was formed. There was a group of uh, Arab countries, Saudi Arabia being the principal, uh, but then you know Venezuela and any other countries uh, decide to form OPEC and say, oh, we don't wanna sell a lot of oil, we're gonna restrict supply, and the price of oil really reached up to $40. Uh, so $3 to $40 in just a few years. That's more than tenfold increase. When that happened, all the oil producing countries are raking in the money. Saudi Arabia, smiling big time. Russia, or I should say Soviet Union at that time, it was a communist economy. Very inefficient, as you can imagine, very inefficient, but they could hide their inefficiency because money was raking in at $40 per barrel. They were smiling big. Venezuela, all these countries were benefiting at the expense of American consumers and many other consumers. America went through the stagflation period. Then the oil prices began to go down as there were more supply coming onto the market. Uh, America began to produce more oil. There was a discovery uh, in the British uh, North Sea. Uh, so Britain began to produce more oil. So as more oil uh, appeared, prices went down. And look at the circle part, the circle part near 1988 uh, period. So oil prices really collapsed. When that happened, it reached to the point where Berlin Wall fell down and the Soviet Union collapsed. Without the oil money, it just simply could not function. Soviet Union collapsed and you had all this breakaway republic, Georgia, Armenia, Ukraine, uh, and separately uh, Russia. Since that time, you see the oil price volatility. Well, today, as you know, oil prices are high and terrible, sad situation in Ukraine. So what's happening on Russia? They're raking in money. America is putting sanctions on Russia. Russia said, who cares? We can sell our oil to India. We can sell our oil to China and we are still raking it in. Uh, even if we put a small discount, 10% discount, this is a huge amount of money they are raking in. Uh, so right now, high oil prices is benefiting all oil producers. And of course, realtors who drive more and right now uh, you know, it's hurting the consumer's uh, condition. So let's see what's happening regarding potential supply from the US. I put that red line in the middle to indicate the lockdown period of March, 2020. I remember when the lockdown happened because I was looking forward to watching the March Madness college basketball, but it didn't happen. We had a lockdown, uh, this ugly virus coming into the country. Well, look at the before the COVID lockdown and after. This is amount of oil drilling equipments that companies are ordering and shipment of those. So the amount of drilling equipment was more active before COVID. Today, we have very high oil prices. So you would think, oh, let's drill more, drill more, more supply. But somehow the oil companies are not doing that. Whether they think the uh, Washington policymakers are highly anti-oil and they said, no, we don't want to do it because it's very risky. Uh, the Washington may put a lot of regulatory burden, tax burden and others. So America is not drilling as much as uh, what it used to, especially in light of very high oil prices. That just means that high gasoline prices look to be with us for quite some time. Russia will be raking in the money American consumers will continue to uh, face high oil prices. We care about climate change. In fact, this building here that I am in, Washington, D.C., 
let me just step out of the way so it's to it'll remove the glare and I'm not sure if you are able to see it. Uh, yeah, it's, so I'm, right behind me, one can see slight tip of the US Capitol. So we are just a couple of blocks from the US Capitol. And when we built this building, everyone were very proud because this was the first green designated building in Washington, DC when it was uh, constructed 15 years ago. Uh, and people should care about the climate change. I mean, this is a very big issue. At the same time, we have to recognize we don't have enough solar panels, we don't have enough wind energy. Therefore, until we reach that time, which may be 10 years from now, 20 years from now, we still need oil. But without oil production, it just means that oil producers will raking the money uh, while the uh, people who need to use oil, realtors especially, uh, one will feel the squeeze from it. So that transition, you know, we cannot just blindly say, okay, let's rely on solar energy uh, because it's simply not there at the moment. Now, oil prices are contributing to this highest consumer price inflation in 40 years. If you are age under 40 years old, you have never seen prices rising at this fast pace. Highest in 40 years. And it could go higher because there's no sign that oil prices will retreat. The food prices, Ukraine has been one of the biggest exporters of agricultural products like wheat. Uh, and with the export you know, not happening just because of the uh, terrible situation there, and also the sanction on Russia uh, ex export on the agriculture, we may see even higher uh, price of bread and others. So consumer price inflation may continue to march higher, which means that Federal Reserve, they're watching this graph carefully. If it rises to 9%, if it rises to 10%, then they may have to say, we have to be even more aggressive in raising interest rate, which means the mortgage rate may reach 6%. So we hope we are at the topping point of the consumer price inflation. So the Fed do not have to raise interest rates so aggressively, but if the consumer prices inflation continue to be out of control, uh, it will force Federal Reserve to raise uh, interest rates. Now here's a graph for people who were uh, uh, in this session uh, one year ago, I think I went to it, but I know we have many other uh, new people uh, in the, uh, audience. So briefly, inflation is bad, but if there is one silver lining as related to real estate, it looks like home prices generally keeps up with inflation. So 1970s, inflation rate was high, 7.1% a year, some years a little more, other years a little less, but on average 7.1%. Home prices, 9.9% .9 a year, it did better than consumer price inflation. And then you look down the other decades, even through the subprime lending foreclosure days, if you stretch it out over a 10 year period, home prices match up with consumer price inflation. So therefore, if you encounter clients or neighbors who said, I don't like this inflation, I'm not sure what I can do, do I buy stock, do I buy gold? Well, you can say that the past experience has shown that home prices is a very good hedge against inflation. In other words, people don't like inflation, a way to protect to some degree is to own real estate. Let's look towards the, now the job market. This job picture for all 50 states shows what it is in the latest data, which is as February of this year versus March, 2020 when we had the lockdown, when the March madness was canceled two years ago. So how did the job market perform? Well, for Maryland, uh, it is geographically small size. It was just one of the most beautiful states. You know, you have the mountains, you have the ocean, you know, you have the major cities of Baltimore and DC, the Chesapeake Bay, the crab, oh, I love crabs. So Maryland is, uh, you know, very diverse. Uh, yet one of the geographically small. So I have to put Maryland on the side, on the right-hand side. And if you see on the right-hand side, uh, Maryland minus 1.8. So I hope you can locate that Maryland minus 1.8. So what does minus 1.8 mean? It means that the number of people with jobs in Maryland 
it is 1.8% fewer jobs today compared to pre-COVID, 1.8% fewer jobs. Pennsylvania, they're down more, minus 2.5. Uh, Virginia is doing a little better at minus 1.3. Uh, so you see some variation. The orange color states are the only states where they actually have more jobs today compared to pre-COVID days. Look at Utah, 5.5 plus, meaning they have 5.5% more job today than before, which explains why home prices are going gangbuster uh, in Utah. They don't have inventory, uh, yeah, but you know, whatever inventory shows up, there is a multiple offers constantly. And no multiple offers is happening in Howard County. But trust me, it is even more intense uh, in places like Idaho and Utah uh, because of a strong job creation uh, to emphasize, especially in a rising interest rate environment. Higher interest rate is squeeze off some buyers, but job creation at least can neutralize some of the negative impact of higher interest rates. So uh, some job creation uh, states you, just, you can see uh, Maryland, it looks like it will soon turn positive in say two or three months based on recent trends. Now, specifically, if we look at the job market in the DC and the surrounding suburbs. So this would be more like Montgomery County, Prince George's County, and of course the Virginia suburbs along with the DC. Uh, from year 2000, you see the job creation continuing until the COVID lockdown, then there's a loss of job, now trying to recover, but total jobs in the DC and the surrounding suburbs is still down from one year before. I put the jobs in DC because of course, you know, people living in Howard County can either work in DC, work in Howard County or work in Baltimore. They have many, many good options, uh, but once wants to know the strength of the job market and DC is not fully back to their pre-COVID days. But compared to year 2000, it's been one of the better performing cities in terms of jobs, continuous growth. Now here's the Baltimore and the surrounding suburbs, which includes Howard County. Howard County will be considered with Baltimore County, Baltimore City, uh, and the adjacent uh, counties. So you see uh, that there's a little more fluctuation. I guess the foreclosure crisis of 2008 to 2011 period, there were job losses. And then job creation, you had a lockdown and then trying to recover, but not fully back up. Let me also compare again, Baltimore versus DC. And you can see that DC overall is doing a little better in the long-term trend versus Baltimore. That red line is a reference point from year 2000. So DC is well ahead of year 2000, while the Baltimore and the suburbs are marginally above the year 2000 level. One interesting part about the current labor market is this strange phenomena where there are help wanted sign everywhere. The red line represent people who are unemployed and searching for job, while the blue line is help wanted sign. They're help wanted sign at the restaurant, at the hotel, help one assign, you go to the LinkedIn, you know, white color occupation like computer coding, accountants, teachers, construction workers. We don't have enough construction workers. So we have a very strange situation where job openings are much higher than people who are unemployed. In fact, the ratio is two to one. So theoretically, an unemployed person could actually find two jobs. This is a very unique case uh, in America. I think many other countries will be very envious of what's happening in America uh, because you graduate from college, say in Korea, or you graduate from college in um, Italy, uh, you wonder whether you have a job. Uh, but here in America, look at the situation, uh, quite amazing, uh, but, uh, but it also imply intense labor shortage. But one area where there is no labor shortage is people are just wanting to be a realtor. So we are seeing record high membership. We have no control over this. I admire people with entrepreneurial spirit to wanting to say, I wanna be my own business person. So you admire that. But you, at the same time, you have to understand there is more competition. If a new realtor, their first client is their uncle, 
that means that uncode is no longer available to other realtors out there. So it's chipping away at some potential client based fiercely competitive marketplace, uh, but the real estate market condition right now is uh, still uh, very good. Home sales. This is the annual home sales nationwide. Howard County would very follow very similar to this condition. So 2005 was the artificial bubble subprime lending. Thank goodness we don't have subprime lending. All the mortgages are very sound credit quality. Uh, so, but the subprime lending of 2005 led to artificial boom and subsequently foreclosure crisis. But right now we don't have those subprime lending. So housing market is on firm foundation and recently completed here, uh, you know, one of the best over the past 15 years. Howard County data is similar. You had a 10% increase in sales last year and it would be one of the best I think in over the past 15 years. So home sales doing very, very really well. Um, and the prices, uh, this is two markets. Again, the DC Metro, which is the suburbs along with the Baltimore Metro and the suburbs. Uh, the DC is a little more expensive. Again, you saw the job market condition in DC. And of course the federal government supporting the federal government along with all the lobbyists uh, and the uh, contractors uh, that uh, leads to somewhat higher income in the DC region, which that leads to uh, more bidding of the homes into higher prices. Uh, but overall, uh, Baltimore area, record high home prices, uh, same thing in the DC market. Um, and just, uh, I guess, um, what Warren Buffett had said, when everyone is scared, when everyone is scared, that is when you may wanna consider striking, meaning make the deal. So back in 2012, when we had that foreclosure crisis, home prices in the Baltimore region, again, Howard County, Baltimore County, typical home was 200,000. Today, it's approaching 400,000. You know, one could have essentially double. Uh, but of course, you know, during that financial crisis, some people did not have money, some people did not have jobs, uh, but those who had the financial resources, if they went in, they would have done quite well. Uh, go to your Howard County Association website because there's many detailed good data. February of this year, one thing that I am uh, monitoring uh, is that the number of the closing activity, which is uh, that 237 you see on the right-hand side, closed sales, that is down 7.1%. So we are starting off the year a little lighter compared to last year. And I think one of the contributing factor is this rising interest rates, rising interest rates, squeezing away some buyers. Now, home ownership rate, interestingly, is that we had this exceptional housing market boom during the COVID period. So market did very well, but home ownership rate barely budged. And if one looks at by race and ethnicity, one sees the following which is very distressing. I mean, you say in America, uh, we believe in uh, uh, opportunity for everyone, but what you see on the chart is that the home ownership rate among white Americans, 75%, and you say, oh, congratulations, this is very good uh, figure. Uh, Asian Americans trying to increase. That little circle that I put, uh, that I think is a mismeasurement. They were trying to measure home ownership rate during the lockdown. You know, people cannot walk the streets. So I think there's a little mismeasurement. Uh, but one tried to see the latest data uh, compared to a little before that little lockdown. And what one sees is that home ownership rate has really not changed uh, for you know Hispanics, uh, Black Americans, and especially for Black Americans, where you see actually the home ownership rate actually was sliding down even before uh, COVID. Uh, this, is, this is very distressing uh, because, uh, you know, whether it is a unconscious bias, which I think most realtors and more Americans should be aware of, uh, about the unconscious bias, and then things like appraisal bias, other obstacles uh, that are in place, uh, which is the reason why, you know, we try to look at the home ownership opportunity in much more detail. We did some snapshot. Uh, of home buyers and sellers. So for example, who are African-American home buyers? Who are the sellers? Uh, and we share this information with HUD. So HUD can try to implement policy, trying to address this so that more Americans can become homeowners. Can you imagine if every American were at 75% home ownership rate? I mean, we should be celebrating that. 
So this is not a question about trying to bring down white American home ownership rate. Uh, we are trying to push up uh, the minority home ownership rate to, to match up, to reflect the opportunity and the progress that American offers. But right now, this chart clearly is seeing, showing that there's much, much uh, that needs to be done uh, to get any degree of some equalization. Um, and when we did our study, uh, we, we got a note from Secretary of HUD, uh, Marsha Fudge, uh, just acknowledging uh, that our study on the issue, uh, and then they will use our report to sort of come up with the policy measures that assures more opportunities for Americans to become uh, homeowners. So uh, let's uh, wait and see. I mean, that includes things like funding. Uh, you know, Secretary Fudge has said, well, maybe do we need down payment assistance for moderate income families? Uh, do we need uh, funding so that some of the disused property, say uh, empty shopping mall, can it be converted into uh, residential units? Or say for rehabs, you know, there are many properties in Baltimore uh, that are vacant. Can they uh, funding some funding requirements so that it becomes habitable? Uh, things like that, uh, because we want to assure that there's greater home ownership opportunities for more Americans. Now, inventory level, as we know, are at a tremendously low level, but I think this year we will turn the corner. When I say turn the corner, what it means is that by summer of this year, you will say, oh, inventory in July is higher compared to July of last year. So that's what I mean by turning. You compare with one year before, and I think we will finally get more inventory. This does not mean we are back to balanced market. It just means that some of the intense multiple offer situation will steadily diminish as they become a more inventory choices uh, become available. So why do I believe that inventory will rise? Well, first good news is that builders are building more. I mean, this is one easy inventory growth uh, and there's a profit incentives, build it and there are buyers. I know there are some supply chain issues. The garage store is not arriving on time of trying to find some of the contractors is taking a long time. Uh, so there are some supply chain issue, worker shortage issue, but whatever the builders complete at the end, and they said, oh, all this delay is leading to need to charge a little more. But the consumers are saying, okay, that's fine. Just charge more and I will still buy. There's a profit motive, economic incentive. So the builders building more means more supply. The second source of inventory, which I don't have on the graph, but is this terrible tragedy that COVID has inflicted to the world. Globally, 6 million have died from COVID. In America, the figure is about 1 million. Now, some people can dispute uh, was the death related to heart attack or COVID, people can dispute. But one thing that people cannot dispute is the high number of death certificate over the past couple of years. We have had a sharp increase in number of death certificate. You know, whether it is a, a car crash, drug overdose, everything combined, the number of death certificate issued in America has sharply risen in the past two years. So what happened in the past two years? I mean, you have to clearly say COVID occurred. So uh, without a doubt that COVID has been co the contributor. And the people who have succumbed to COVID are people in the very old age group, people in their 70s, people in their 80s. So what it means is that some elderly may need help in their housing adjustment. A person has become a widow and they say, I don't need this large house anymore. I want to downsize. So maybe that becomes an inventory or a house is empty and it needs that to be an estate sale. And it takes time to go through this legal procedure. But the fact that the COVID has inflicted this you know, terrible tragedy on America globally, uh, it, it means that people need help on housing adjustment. So expect more estate sales to steadily show up onto the market or people who need to downsize uh, from it. But the main source of housing inventory is what you see on the screen, builders building more, they wanna build more, there's an economic incentive. Let me uh, wrap it up. Uh, I have two more charts with uh, the following. So this is a survey by the Federal Reserve of New York across the country on consumer expectation. 
what are the consumers expecting? And this data was collected in February when the mortgage rates were 4%. So mortgage rate have already risen. So you ask consumers about home prices and consumers believe on average, home prices will rise 5.1% uh, this year. Next year, about 2% a year. So people are not so optimistic about home prices in, in the future years, but at least this year, they believe home prices will rise 5%. So this is what your consumers may be thinking. What about rent? People believe rents will rise even faster. Now, of course, rising mortgage rate is negative to the housing, but rising rent is actually good for housing because people say, why am I paying higher rent? Maybe I wanna become homeowners, uh, you know, figure out uh, some way. So people believe rents will be rising even faster. Then the question, is buying a home a good financial investment or bad financial investment? And by overwhelming margin, American consumers today believe, even at higher mortgage rates, that it is a good financial investment. So keep this in mind as you talk with your potential clients. These are what average consumer in America are thinking. So my last slide is forecast, what you can anticipate. So 2021, the blue uh, sort of bar that you see was recently completed year, good year, you know, home sales increased 8.5%. Howard County did better, increase of 10%. Uh, prices, you know, very sharply uh, increased. So the dollar volume was very positive, combination of increased sales and increased prices. But in 2022, home sales will come down. In fact, I have to readjust the forecast. I think the forecast uh, for home sales is about 6% decline this year. And I say 6% decline uh, because, 6% uh, decline because of the much higher mortgage rate than what I anticipated. Uh, and the inflation is much higher, but the prices are in no danger of declining and therefore the prices will hold on in some, this year dollar revenue will be roughly the same as last year. So if you thought last year was a good year, this year will essentially match that. Only issue is you have more competition, more realtors practicing, so keep that in mind. And in 2023, I think it's the job creation. Uh, mortgage rate increases would have already been finished by then. Hopefully inflation is contained. Uh, so it's really about job creation and that will begin to squeak out some gains in sales activity. So thank you very much for giving me time uh, to share some of my thoughts uh, with everyone. And now I am going to turn it back, uh, I guess, to President uh, Sarah Anderson. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yoon. Uh, we really appreciate you taking the time to share this information with us and for giving us tools that are going to help assure um, our colleagues and our buyers in this wild, wild real estate market. So thank you so much. Thank you. We do have one question. Um, if you have a minute, Sarah, do you see it in the q and I do. Let's see. So we have a question from Sean Monahan, and Sean asks, when the Fed raises rates, the banks win due to paying more interest. Why is that? How does this help the consumer? Uh, so the reason why the Fed is raising interest rate uh, is not about helping or hurting consumers. It's about trying to contain inflation. Uh, essentially, the Federal Reserve is saying that there's too much money out there, therefore just pushing up the prices higher and higher, and we have to contain inflation. People who remember the 1970s will say, yeah, 1970s was terrible. Rising prices, and then slowly began to impact the overall economy uh, with job cuts and job cuts. So Fed do not want to see that. So therefore, they're trying to raise interest rate not to help the banks, uh, not to hurt the consumers, uh, but trying to contain inflation. So that's why they are monitoring oil prices and other food prices uh, very carefully. Thank you for that response. And Sean has a follow-up question, and that is when are the foreclosures going to start? Uh, the foreclosure, I think the, some data is indicating is up 400% from one year ago, 400%. Uh, and you say, wow, well, you, that's a large number. But we had essentially no foreclosures. So if you had no foreclosures and something rises by 400%, maybe it goes from one to four foreclosures. So these are very minor number in terms of the foreclosures. I know one realtor in New Jersey, his business model is based on foreclosures. So he constantly mentioned, when are we going to seek foreclosures? And I said, we may not see all that much, 
we will see an increase, uh, you know, uh, because now the mortgage forbearance period is coming to an end. Uh, and many people who could not pay mortgages, they were given a timeout period to say, no problem, you don't have to pay mortgage. But that time period is ending. And some people hopefully can find job and make mortgage payments, but not everyone will be able to do so. And they have to sell their home. But when they sell their home, it doesn't have to be a foreclosure. Home prices have risen and they say, oh, I can make money. I will do just normal sell. Uh, so I think the foreclosures number will rise, but it's just rising from very low levels. So overall insignificant to the market, uh, but the, there will be some distressed homeowners who have to make mortgage payments and they don't have a job and they will say, I will sell my home. So thank you very much. I don't know if we have any other time for more questions. I know we're a little bit over. Um, is it? I've had three pop okay, into the chat. One final question. Let's just do okay. one final question. Okay. This last question is from Anthony, and and Anthony says the question uh, he believes on everybody's mind is when will more sellers come into the market? Will rising interest rates necessarily have a direct or indirect impact on sellable inventory, and if so, why? It's odd that the market would want rates to rise to see more inventory come onto the market, yet that seems to be the case. Can you please comment? Um, so uh, I think you know, there are uh, several elements. You know, one is the ending of the mortgage forbearance will lead to some increase in inventory. Home builders building more. And I mentioned about the COVID debt uh, you know, tragedy uh, where people need some housing adjustment. The other part is the cat and mouse game. That is to say, some people want to sell their home but they knew that if they sold, they may not be able to buy and they did not want to be in that situation. So if the inventory was a little looser, then they would be willing to list knowing that they can buy some property. Uh, so as we get more inventory, I mean, this will be a positive loop of more sellers willing to. Uh, now with interest rate rising, it means that some of the days on the market, which is still very quick, will begin to lengthen. As the market LinkedIn, people will say, well, you know, the, the multiple offers are less intense or not even occurring. And that gives potential home sellers a little uh, comfort level to say, yeah, maybe I can't sell it. I mean, I'm not gonna get that intense multiple offers, but at least I have a better chance of buying the next property. Uh, so uh, my overall prediction is that you know, we are reaching the cusp and certainly by summer of this year, there will be more homes listed for sale compared to summer of last year. Awesome, thank you so much for that, that answer. Thank you for taking a few extra minutes to, to answer that question. And um, we wish you a wonderful day. Thank you to everyone that logged on today. And thanks again to Dr. Lawrence Yoon.